Thank you, Ian. When I um, was looking at coming to Australia and uh, Ian got in touch and I swear I would come to Australia just for Bendigo. I've, I've been here before. I love it. Uh, the people here, it's, it seems like home to me. Uh, I grew up in California. My great my grandfathers were miners, <laughs> silver and gold miners. <laughs> so <laughs> Bendigo's like, yeah. <laughs> uh, anyway, thank you for coming out tonight. Um, what's up there? Yeah, drawdown. Drawdown uh, in the context of climate has actually been a term around for a long time, but you don't hear it, you haven't heard it. And what it means is that first time on a year to year basis where greenhouse gases peak and go down. And um, I'm going to get back to that in a minute. The next slide I want to show you is really about science. And you might have to plug your ears a little bit here. Um, see if this works. This is Greenland in the summer. This is the Greenland North Indian Ice Research Station. It's 250 miles from the closest human artifact. I mean like a candy bar wrapper. Uh, it's so remote. There's just nothing there except it. Um, and what you see there is an ice cave. And in that ice cave, scientists in 14 countries have spent 10 years um, uh, drilling through two miles of ice down to bedrock. And um, their purpose is to study the Enian period, which is 125,000 years ago. Um, and I show that because you can only be there 90 days. It's extremely dangerous to be there. Um, when I was there, a scientist who was sort of the go-to person who told you how to survive and what to do in a whiteout and all those sort of things about survival, um, disobeyed his own instructions, was caught out in the whiteout, uh, tried to find his way back, got lost, was found the next day, and became a double amputee just 10 days before we got there. And um, when I hear climate science or scientists being denigrated by um, ignorant people, primarily ignorant politicians and so forth, I think of these people and what they've done. Um, and this is what they do is they bring up ice cores and around the metal is an ice core. And when you bring these up, you can put a, it's a caliper, it's kind of like a nano cathode and you can go over it and they can measure exactly how much CO2, the pollen count, the sulfate in these tiny, tiny air bubbles in the ice. And they benchmark that or uh, uh, with the uh, results they're getting in the Antarctica um, and other places. And with that, you know, we've come up with some very, very clean and clear ideas of not only what goes on uh, for the last 400,000 years, but now it's back 20 million years. We know pretty much what was going on on this planet. For the last 400,000 years, you can see the CO2 levels. That circle is the Eemian period, by the way, 125,000 years ago. Um, the Our species, Homo, Homo floridiensis, Homo erectus, Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens sapiens, uh, we've been here two million years. We never lived on the earth when it was over 300 ppm in CO2 until 1939. So th what that tells us is that we're in Terra uh, Nova. We don't really know where we are as a species. But the uh, circle on the left actually shows what the ppm was during the Eemian period. At that time, it was 1 to 2 C higher in temperature than the pre-industrial period. And uh, oceans were 20 to 30 feet higher. Um, there was crocodiles going up the British Columbia coast to breed in Alaska. Hippopotamus were lounging in the Thames River Delta. And lions and giraffes were romping across Germany and Denmark. And there was a very different regime, um, just at a very slight difference in temperature. Um, but um, the most important thing I want to show you is this, actually. This is the actual PPM right now. Uh, the other one shows it at 407 to 410. 490 counts the other greenhouse gases. And one of the things that I don't understand, and I can't explain to you, why the Paris Agreement uh, talks about stabilization, hopefully, in 2050 at 450 ppm. We went past 450 ppm a long time ago. 490 includes nitrous oxide, methane, and the other greenhouse gases, HCFCs. Um, and they're just as powerful as CO2. 
and this is in CO2 equivalent. Uh, and so if we hit 450 in 2050, we'll be at 560, 570 uh, at that time in terms of the actual PPM. So going back to the word drawdown is that from my point of view, the idea that we should, and the term you commonly hear is that we should mitigate climate change. We should mitigate. You hear mitigation all the time. And uh, I'm not trying to make you feel bad, but does anybody really know what mitigation means? And mitigation, I'll tell you. So, you know, <laughs> mitigation means reducing the pain and seriousness of something. And the idea that somehow at 490 ppm we should be mitigators doesn't make any sense at all, given what happened at 290 ppm uh, during the Emian period. Okay, so in other words, we're way out of whack in our language, in our commitment. I think the goals that have been established by the climate establishment, frankly, are anemic. And in, in, from my point of view, the bigger the goal, it, it opens up possibility, creativity, uh, as opposed to forecloses it. When you have very narrow goals, you get very narrow outcomes. And I feel like right now we have very narrow goals uh, around climate change, stabilization, reduction, resilience, adaptation, mitigation. I'm not saying those aren't important, adaptation, resilience, et cetera. I'm just saying is those aren't the ultimate goals because what you see in this slide here is basically a pretty much almost a straight line, uh, geologically speaking. It's never happened before ever. Right? This is the highest it's been in 20 million years in terms of greenhouse gases. And the idea that somehow we're going down the wrong way too fast and we should mitigate it, that would slow down, is absurd because it says we're going to go over a cliff or we keep going, we should slow down and go over the cliff slowly. No. I mean, how inspiring is that? I mean, can you rally the troops? No, you can't, you can't, there's, you can't even organize around that goal. And um, so most people get their information about climate change like this, and they get it in headlines that are based on recently released scientific papers. So the headline is correct. I'm not sure about the uh, Tower Bridge and the wall water, but <laughs> it looks interesting. And, um, and the purpose of those headlines is very directed and known, which is to basically get your fight or flight system going. I was to startle you, to surprise you, to feel, do you feel threatened? So you feel like, whoa, you know, and, and, and get your heart rate up and everything. And with that, next to it, of course, is what you see is clickbait, which is a real reason they're doing the, the headline. And the clickbait about the woman, you know, basically smashing her husband's head with a frog ornament and mummifying him for 18 years actually is the purpose of it, which is, is comic relief. It may be true. I suppose it is. I don't know. But it's, but basically what's happening, the way we're learning about climate change is a manipulation of the human psyche. And the purpose of the headlines is actually to sell you something. Here's another one. And um, the headline, again, is correct. It's a study done by Peter Bates. I don't agree with the conclusion, but it's a really great study. And there's 20 things you didn't know you could do with Coca-Cola. And, of course, you do see they're doing the right thing with Coca-Cola, which is pouring it down the toilet. So uh, this, that's more important than the headline in some ways. Um, and then if you, as an individual, see these, hear these, uh, see them on the telly and so forth, and you go, whoa, 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 I want to do something, I, I feel really, you know, you don't have a, you don't have a bend that goes, you don't have a BSR, you know. So you, you want to do something, so you Google. No matter what you Google, the most important solutions, are 10 most, 20 most, what can I do, what can an individual do, you pretty much get these two, which is two scientific organizations. And... If you read these, you know, on the left side, they read like Proverbs, really. I mean, you know, eat smart and be efficient and, you know, love your mother. It should say that, actually, because these are Proverbs. These are Proverbs. They're proverbial, which is like, yeah, these aren't solutions. And the right side, you have putting a power strip in your home entertainment center, which is, well, first you have to get a home entertainment center so you can put a power strip on it. I mean, and the, and so unless you have an IQ lower than room temperature, you look at this and go, this is not adequate to the task at hand. And then you just know, uh, yeah, okay, good thing, right? Washing cold water, everything, but like, really? And then you have on the other side, you have people like Al Gore saying, 
you know, you know, solar, 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 wind, solar, solar, wind, and Elon Musk. And if we do all those three things, we get a hall pass to the 22nd century, or that's the implication. And that's not true. But what's, what's bad about that is that it, it, it makes the individual feel like, well, I hope they do it. There's a they out there, you know, like, because I don't do wind turbines and I don't do solar farms and I don't do Elon Musk, you know, so and I can't afford a Tesla anyway. So there's this thing of dis, this disengagement of community, of place, of, of individuals, of families and so forth is embedded in the language that we're using around climate change and uh, global warming. And so I wanted to know where we stood. I wanted to know for a long time. Starting in 2001, in 2013, Bill McKibben came out with a piece in, Glo uh, in Rolling Stone in July, and it said, Global Warming is Terrifying New Math. Some of you may have read it, and uh, uh, what he did is he took the work of Mark Campanale in London at Carbon Tracker, and Mark is a financial analyst, and he analyzed the balance sheets of every coal, gas, and oil company in the world and said, um, you may call them assets. But if you burn them, it's Venus. So they're not assets because we wouldn't even be here alive to burn them, much less their assets. And what Bill did in his article in Rolling Stone is burn them, <laughs> which is why it was terrifying. And I had people come to me, activists and people like yourselves and Ian and others, you know, uh, who have been very capable in, um, in, in what they do, saying it's game over. Or it's, I read Bill's piece, it's game over. And that's when I decided to do Drawdown. So what is Project Drawdown? Project Drawdown map, measures, and models the 100 most substantive solutions to reversing global warming. Why do we do it? Because it's never been done. Never. In 50 years, climate change has been in the public sphere. We've never mapped, measured, or modeled 40 top solutions, the 50 top solutions, 60, 75. I'm not kidding. If you don't think I'm correct, go find them tonight. <laughs> not there. It's an astonishing thing when you think about it. And from my point of view, I literally want to know, well, where do we stand? And so that's how Project got started, Project Drawdown got started. We were an NGO in Sausalito, California, not exactly a bastion of institutional and academic credibility. And so uh, we didn't have any money either. Uh, and so we reached out uh, to the world and to institutions, including University of Melbourne, uh, ANU, uh, all over the, the world for uh, research fellows. And so the research that's in the book and the website and the models of Drawdown uh, really came from these core researchers, half of whom are PhDs, 22 countries, six continents, a diverse group of extraordinary people, Rhodes Scholars, Fulbright Scholars, White House Fellows, Aga Khan Award winners, unbelievable people. They showed up all over the world for uh, really a tuppence to do this and write a master's thesis on one solution. Um, and with them, we added 128 advisors, politicians, botanists, biologists, engineers, architects, activists, writers, artists, um, business people, um, and uh, IPCC lead authors, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change lead authors, um, to advise on content. And then we added 40 outside experts, scientific reviewers, to that group to review the models themselves. So what you see in Drawdown has been gone over by many, many people and represents the work of a coalition. It's a, it's a collaboration. It's not um, my opinion or my bias or our staff's bias. It's all of us working together around the world uh, to come up with the data that you see. And that's exactly what we do. We just do math. We really don't do anything else. And the math, where does it come from? Well, it comes from two places, really. On the top side, you see ranking, and then you'll see gigatons, right? That, those numbers represent CO2 or CO2 equivalents uh, in some cases, but that's all based on peer-reviewed science. Now, every solution we modeled is scaling, hands-on. We know how to do it. There's a lot of data behind it, both economically and scientifically. So on the scientific side, we, we only use models, uh, solutions that had peer-reviewed science. Otherwise, we didn't do it. 
and um, and when there was a divergence in the science, as there is with land use, uh, we chose uh, uh, we did sensitivity analyses and did chose a low median. On the economic side, uh, which you see there on the bottom, um, is uh, the cost uh, and uh, the net savings, if there is one, uh, with the solution. As I said, everything was scaling. We scaled them continuously for 30 years. In other words, we took what is growing and we grew it in a rigorous but reasonable way over 30 years. And that's, this is the out outcome. Now, some cases like LED, they stop growing in 19, 20, 32, 33, because it's every bulb is LED. There is no incandescence. Or, um, so the scaling rate of all of them may vary, but they're based on really data that's out there. And the numbers there uh, as a negative number in terms of cost, so how could a geothermal plant cost nothing? Well, or, or uh, the reason is because we use a reference case. And when I stop this, then we'll just stop geeking out here a minute. But I want to provide you a sense of the, of the rigor and the science and that went into drawdown. Uh, this is not about antidotes. And we use a reference case, and the reference case is business as usual by the World Bank or the IPCC or the IEA. They have a reference case of what's going to happen between now and 2050 in terms of population, economic growth, energy use, etc. So that's what we measured against. So in the case of geothermal, we looked at where it was implementable, practical, applicable, which is not that many places in the world, frankly. Um, and then we compared that to the business as usual case, which would have been combined cycle gas or coal. And in those cases, geothermal is less expensive. So that's why it's a negative cost. And then uh, over 30 years, the, the profit or the net savings over business as usual, coal or combined cycle gas, is $1.0 tr trillion. Um, so what I want to show you here is just quickly just the diversity of solutions. Uh, again, we tend to focus on clean energy. It's, we should focus on it, no question about it. Uh, it's something we can do uh, and do well. But the solutions to reversing global warming are quite diverse than much, much, much more diverse than clean energy. Aforestation is putting trees where they haven't been before or they were cut down so long ago that we've forgotten they were forests, like Iceland was a forest, you know. Um, High-speed rail, nothing to be said about that except the Japanese and Chinese own that one. This is indigenous people's land management, extremely important solution. Um, indigenous means, uh, is the adjective of indigene. Indigene is a noun. It's a noun that means the original inhabitant of the land. There's aboriginal here, but indigene is the same word. And it turns out that those people, uh, those cultures know the land the best <laughs> everywhere in the world. And they manage it in a way that protects that bottom right hand figure which is an extraordinary amount of CO2 in biomass and below the soil. And this is improved rice cultivation. There's two ways to do it, to reduce methane emissions by 50%. As you know, methane is 34 times more powerful than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. And uh, anaerobic rice paddies are big producers of methane. The two methods cost nothing. They raise the productivity of the rice and uh, of the crop and actually lower the cost. So there's no cost there. There is savings. Uh, this is onshore wind. Onshore wind now is actually the cheapest form of newly installed electrical generation in the world, except for a few places. Um, and it, it, it now is number one. This is Bloomberg. This is Goldman Sachs. This is Morgan Stanley. This is uh, IEA. I mean, basically, this is the cheapest form of electricity in the world today. Not coal, that's for sure. And this is uh, offshore wind. Um, and um, the reason we separate them is because the cost structure of offshore is very different than onshore. So we don't put them together as one solution. Um, this is women smallholders. Um, you say, well, what is this doing in a book about reversing global warming? <laughs> it's doing a lot. Um, women um, smallholders, which is under five acres, uh, around the world produce 75% of the world's food. Well, I started in the organic food business when I was 20 years old and in Boston. And I was shamed 
criticized, excoriated by professors at Harvard and MIT, and op-eds from Big Ag about this hippie way of growing food, organic food, was selfish, narcissistic, um, impractical, the world would starve, how could you, etc. It just went on and on. It's that way even to this day. So let's look at the numbers. Remember I said we do the math. That's what we do. Big ag produces, or industrial agriculture produces, 25% of the world's food. Okay, one quarter. But what does it produce? Corn and soy for pigs and cows. When you go to McDonald's, big ag, everything, every step, every bit of it you see there, right? So it produces hydrogenated fat, it produces sugar, it produces basically foods that make the world sick. It produces heart disease, stroke, cancer, type 2 diabetes, big pharma. That's what big ag does. It doesn't feed the world, it sickens the world. There's exceptions, of course wheat and bread, and so forth. But I mean, primarily, big ag is not what feeds us. It what takes advantage, what takes advantage of us. But even if it didn't do that, what it does do is destroy the soil. Absolutely, without question. Women smallholders are from 43 to 50% of the smallholders in the world are women. Do the math. 43 times 75, in other words, it's like women produce more food in Big Egg. Again, so many of the things in Drawdown were, who knew, who knew? We didn't know, that's for sure. But the thing about the women is that if they get the same support, tool seeds, uh, instruction, tenure, as men, they produce 20 to 30% more food than men. And if we do that and scale that up over 30 years, what you see in that figure, 2.06 gigatons of CO2 um, sequestered or avoided in terms of emissions is avoided deforestation. In other words, we don't have to deforest hundreds of millions of acres to produce the food that these women can pr provide if we just support them. So that's why Women Smallholders is there. Walkable cities, um, this is solar. That This is an Uru woman in Lake Titicaca. She's grinning, not because she's made a contribution to global warming, um, she's grinning because she lives on a straw island with a straw hut and she used a kerosene lamp every night so her daughters could do their homework. And so she's grinning because she's become even a better mother to her daughters. And I think this underlines a really important point. When you look at the 100 solutions in Drawdown, 99 of them are no regret solutions, which is that if there wasn't a climate scientist alive and we were clueless as to what was causing extreme weather, we should do them, we want to do them. They have so many co-benefits for children, water, health, you know, for education, uh, for jobs, for prosperity, for well-being. It just goes on and on and on and on, you know. And so the idea that solving this problem Problems, you know, the crisis of a civilization is 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 divergent from economic well-being is upside down and backwards because these solutions do not uh, externalize their costs on other generations. Basically, what we do now is steal the future, settle in the present, call it, you know, GDP, and then pat ourselves on the back, you know, for being so clever. And uh, these solutions do the opposite. They regenerate the future, and we sell that in the, in the present and call that GDP. It's our choice. Heal the future or steal it. If we steal it, you can forget it. It's game over, for sure. But the pathway to reversing global warming is to heal the future, and that means it employs people, it supports our children, it supports and addresses the suffering of people all around the world. This is um, bike infrastructure. We didn't model bikes. We, bought, we modeled cities that actually make bikes m possible and safe. And uh, that's Copenhagen, green roofs. Um, this is regenerative agriculture. Um, basic is agriculture that doesn't break the soil, doesn't till, doesn't disc, doesn't ever, ever, ever break the soil. And what it does do is make the soil healthier and healthier, increase the biome, uh, the carbon, the life of the soil. Um, 
and it's a significant solution and a significant sequester of carbon. Net zero buildings uh, are growing like uh, weeds. Uh, this is forest protection. This is a great bear forest in um, British Columbia. That's the Kermode bear, uh, the, the great white, the white bear eating, snacking on salmon, <laughs> snatched from the river. This is clean cook stoves. Um, uh, this is telepresence. Uh, this person who's got his hand up in the air is in Montreal. Um, he's waving to, um, uh, he's at an accounting firm. Um, he's waving to Ivan, who's in Prague. And so <laughs> what you can do, um, uh, I think this is KPMG, I'm not, I'm not sure, but... Um, but what you can do in this office is basically around the world, you can log on to an iPad, iPad on, a, on a stick, on a Segway almost. You can log on and you can start scooting around the office and go to meetings and uh, go to offices and show up and talk to somebody. In other words, it's how we're going to travel pretty soon. Uh, it's not first class, but it is uh, uh, interesting, um, especially if, you know, somebody could come in right now. I mean, I wish I should could do this sometime in a presentation and have somebody in the back, you know, then basically ask a question. It'd be so cool. But this is a, a, a way of not shipping protoplasm around the world and shipping the ideas instead, which is usually what we want. This is food waste. Um, it's the number three solution. Uh, the United States wastes 133 billion pounds of food every year. It's 40 to 45 percent. Uh, rich people waste food uh, at home and at restaurants and hotels and in the refrigerators where food goes to die. Um, in, the, in, in poor countries, they, uh, poor people don't waste food. Um, but they don't have the support, but the food is lost uh, from the farm to the city or um, to the customer. So there's two different ways it needs to be addressed, um, but it's an extraordinary solution in the sense that we did not measure methane production from landfilled food, and if we did that, I think those numbers would double. Um, not that we should landfill food, but we do. This is household recycling. This is a woman, a Dasanak woman in Ethiopia, uh, they built a bridge where she lives, and they built a bar across the river for the workers who are building the bridge. And so they go there in the morning uh, and pick up all the things the men have thrown away, SIM cards, beer bottle caps mostly, uh, broken wrist watch bands, etc. And they make headdresses and jewelry out of it, and jewelry, and now they sell it to uh, boutiques in France. So, uh, it's so sweet. This is plant-rich diet. It's just reducing protein. Uh, where we're eating too much, increasing it where people are getting too little in the world, about 50, 55 grams. Uh, Aussies, you know, around 90 plus, 95 grams. Uh, so Americans. Um, and then uh, moving a significant amount of that to plant, not all of it. It doesn't, it's not a vegan diet. It's not a vegetarian diet. If you want to be, it can be. Uh, it, you need to eat, you need, we need to eat animals that are grazing the land properly. The land degrades if those animals are taken away. Um, this is marine permaculture. This is not, as you see, no numbers, so we have no data on this except it's scientifically validated. Um, marine permaculture are PET frames that are about a, a kilometer square. They're really big. PET doesn't break down in the oceans. They're 25 meters down where the big tankers cannot chew them up with their propellers. And they have um, these... Um, of tubes that go down to the thermocline, the nutrient-laden waters that are below. And those waters now uh, are being suppressed because 93% of the increased heat uh, from global warming is actually going into oceans and producing thermal blankets which suppress the natural circulation patterns. So what this does is restart it. And when you do this, you see this in three, four weeks, you see phytoplankton, zooplankton, um, you see uh, algae, you see kelp, you see feeder fish, forage fish, you get the whole troph trophic cascade. This happens in marine deserts. And the 99% of tropical oceans are marine deserts. You go there and say, oh, wow, it's so clear. It's so clear because there's no life in that water. Um, and what happens is nothing sequesters carbon faster than kelp. So you're taking the carbonic acid, you're deacidifying the ocean, you're cooling the water, and you can reverse coral bleaching.
You can do all that and grow a lot of protein for people who need it. Repopulating the mammoth step, two Siberian biologists proposing to put animals back to the Arctic Circle where they once were before they were extirpated by us 12,000 years ago. And what they do during the winter um, is brush away the snow to get at the dead browse. This is buffalo, this is muskox, this is reindeer. It was the woolly mammoth, of course, but it's not going to come back. The Yakutian horse, uh, elk, a type of elk. And they can withstand temperatures of minus 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, and um, when they brush away the snow, the temperature of the soil goes down 2 degrees Celsius. So it's a permafrost protection plan, <laughs> basically putting animals back uh, where they once were. This is a hydrogen boron fusion. I've followed this company for 12 years. They were the cover of Time magazine a year and a half ago. Fusion has been a place where you dig a big hole somewhere, you put lots and lots and lots of taxpayer money, and then you bury it, and you never see it again. Um, and somebody says, it's 30 years out, don't worry. It sure is. It's been 30 years out for 40 years. This company was in stealth for 18 years because it's embarrassing to say you're in fusion. Um, it's a will of the wisp. And the fact is, fusion does deal with the will of the wisp, which is called plasma. <laughs> and plasma is like making starlight on Earth. It's a forcing function. It's really difficult. And uh, I was there six weeks ago. I armed the 400 ultra capacitors and press. Uh, uh, after six minutes and triggered it and, and did fusion. And they're coming out, um, I don't know when, 18, 20 months from now, maybe 24 months and so forth. And it's a baseload power based on boron. It's completely safe. If the reactor goes down, you can start it with a Honda generator. And there's no waste. There's hundreds of thousands of years of boron here. Um, all the other fusion reactors in the world are based on deuterium and tritium, which produce neutrons, which are radioactive, which are harmful. Um, and um, so I'm pretty sure it's going to happen. It could, maybe not. But that's why they're called coming attractions. This is building with wood. Um, it's just, it's now, it's, it's been around for quite a while, but now it's starting to just really expand. This is carbon architecture where you're building buildings that sequester carbon. There's only two things we can do about the atmosphere. Stop putting greenhouse gases up there and bring them back home which is what land does, land use, forest, farming, you know, properly managed grasslands and in relationship to ruminants do that. And um, building with wood does that. And these buildings are as or more safe than steel and concrete buildings um, because um, uh, these laminated uh, beams do not burn. They char for sure, but they don't burn. Uh, and these buildings don't get into high temperatures like you see, see at Greenfell or you saw at the Torch Tower in Dubai, which has burned twice now. Um, and they hit temperatures of 1,000 and 1,400 degrees. I mean, because of the material that's in these buildings, including what's in the steel itself. Um, and, uh, so a 90 story building is, is going to go up in London. Um, there was an announcement today about even a bigger building. Uh, there are light. They're very light. They can go places where steel and concrete buildings can't go. Um, and the last coming attraction is a cow walks onto a beach. And and this actually goes to Queensland. There is a, a farmer in Prince Edward, Prince Edward Island who noticed that his cows, I mean, virtually every farm in Prince Edward Island is on the beach. <laughs> it's, not, it's such a tiny little place. Um, but he noticed the dairy cows who ate kelp produced more milk and asked the scientist why, and he said, Maybe because it's not producing as much methane. Because methane production by ruminants is a big source of global emissions. 11% of global emissions can be attributed to uh, cows and sheep. There's 3.3 billion cows and sheep being managed and cared for it and caged and actually in some cases uh, uh, very, very badly treated on your behalf, on our behalf. And they are extraordinary contributors to global warming. Um, and so that was like a science project, like, okay, kelp reduces methane, I think it was about 12%. And this scientist then contacted a scientist in Queensland who's doing the same work, and together they discovered a seaborne algae called Asparagopsis taxiformis, which in fed as a 2% supplement to ruminants reduces methane emissions by 70 to 90%. Um, and that's right out of Australia. 
Um, what surprised us, this goes to the, the comment from Jen, um, everything, um, what surprised us is this, the biggest sector is food. Like, we never saw that coming. We did the model. The models are so interactive, uh, uh, system related that we couldn't really see the individual solutions as we were doing it. We didn't model them as individual solutions. You could do that; it'd be inaccurate. Um, so, very complex systems in which the solutions and the causes reside, and so we really didn't know what it would be. And food makes sense because, in along with transport. It is the largest cause as a sector of global emissions. But what food can do is actually sequester carbon by changing our agricultural practices, by reducing food waste and reducing uh, methane emissions, by taking that food and putting it back onto the land instead of making methane. Um, but there's so many different agricultural practices that uh, can sequester carbon. So it's a twofer. It goes both ways, and most of, most can only go one way. And you see transport is still such a small solution. The reason when I mentioned the reference cases, transport is predicted to double. Notice we have one billion vehicles on the world today, one for every seven people. We expect it to be two billion vehicles uh, by 2050, two for every 10 people. And that's the projections. We have to use those. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the world's transport fleet is going to plummet, actually, because of AVs, uh, autonomous vehicles, electric vehicles, and connected vehicles. I think, actually, it's going to go the other way. But again, this wasn't about what we think or what I believe or what any of our staff believe or the researchers. It's what uh, uh, the, is in the public domain in terms of knowledge. Um, the top solution was refrigerant management. And we were just so disappointed that that was true um, because it was so unsexy. And uh, like we wanted something really cool, you know, and, you know, the uh, hydrofluorocarbons are just like, you can't even barely pronounce it. You go, wow, you know. But they're two to 9,000 times more powerful than CO2. And they're just flying up in the air from decommissioning of ACs and refrigerators. And um, uh, electrical generation, if you combine off and onshore wind, it would be number one. But if you actually do this and you educate girls, and uh, girls uh, are being yanked out of school pre-puberty because of their fathers, their elders, their tribe, their culture, their religion, usually all that mixed together, um, to go to work to put their brothers to school or to, in fact, early for early marriage. And whatever the reason or the cause, they have an average of five children. Um, and we've known this for 40 years. This is not new data. If she's allowed to matriculate through high school and support it in her education, she becomes a woman on her terms, and she chooses to have just over two plus children. And this data has been known forever, too. And um, so it's a pathway to family planning, basically. It's a pathway. It's not control. It's empowerment. A very important change in verb here. Empower these girls to become women on uh, not entirely those terms, uh, pretty much. And she earns more. Those resources go into those two children. They are better educated. They repeat their mother's behavior. And the other way to family planning is to actually do family planning. And um, and that has clinics everywhere in the world to support women's reproductive health and well-being and choices. And you combine the two of those together and uh, can do the math for it. It's 119.2 gigatons. Uh, uh, that's the difference between the high and median uh, UN population projection for 2050. And the UN ascribes it to family planning or the lack thereof. And if you add those two together, the number one solution to reversing global warming is the empowerment of girls and women. You know, not saying a solar panel isn't a good thing, but I'm just saying is that, you know, basically you have a lot of men, white charismatic male vertebrates here in charge of the climate establishment, you know, and they're into things, you know. And I think that what we did is we just did the math, you know, without bias, you know. And what you see is a very, very different set of solutions. At least you see some you never saw before, and you see some in order that no one's ever talked about before. And um, this is a pie chart. And the reason I show this is um, to illustrate or to really 
elucidate the fact there's no such thing as a small solution. We need them all. So the idea that we should just focus on the big ones is not true. We should do them. They're crucial, no question, no question. But it's just like our body or everything, the small things really count. Talk about your thymus gland, it's really tiny. (laughs) <laughs> take it out see how you feel you know I mean it's like so the idea that somehow oh well those are tiny marginal solutions let's focus on the big stuff just isn't correct because it's a system that caused it and only a system will heal it and so you see here three scenarios the plausible scenario remember I said we scaled every solution for 30 years right they all scaled so we scaled them and we use different scaling rates, uh, which was innate to that solution. Um, but they were rigorously scaled, but very reasonably too. And we totaled it up, and we do not achieve drawdown by 2050. And I actually was kind of glad, because if it did, it would kind of it'd feel like we gamed the numbers, or gamed the system, or gamed the model, or something, you know, like. And we had no idea when we went into this what the numbers would show. Maybe we would show game over. Who knew? Uh, we didn't know. Uh, it's what we wanted to know. But we tweak the numbers, and you see in the, in the middle column the drawdown scenario, which is um, uh, we achieve drawdown in 2050. The optimum scenario is we achieve drawdown in 2045. Um, and the book, um, which I think there's some out there, but uh, the most comprehensive plan ever proposed to reverse global warming um, it wasn't our title when it was suggested to me as a subtitle. The Drawdown was our title, but not the subtitle by my publisher. I rejected it immediately. It says, so brash and cheeky and braggadocio, and it's like, ugh, doesn't feel good. But I left it on my desk, and I kept looking at it every day, and I realized it is the most comprehensive plan ever proposed because no one's ever proposed one. <laughs> so I said, okay, well, I'll just take the high ground while it's available. And <laughs> But the, the word plan uh, sort of implies, and I talk about it inside the book, is that it's we have a plan, like we project right out. And that could not be further from the truth. What we're saying is that in the process of, you know, basically, I don't know how many uh, millions of data points that went into the models um, that we discovered that humanity has a collective wisdom about what to do. These solutions exist. They're scaling. We know how to do them. And they have are having impact. And people, like last night I was at Sustainable Victoria and I got a question and frankly somebody's kind of whinging about, well, it's this and that and the coal companies and the politicians and this and uh, uh, uh." all true, but I said this, look at fossil fuels had a 200 year head start on this, right? We started late in the game, so to speak, but not really a game at all. So it's as if we went into a footy, you know, we're one team, there's another team, you know, and, and we, get, we get spotted. They got spotted 100 points. So it's 100 to nothing, and, it's, and we're just starting the game, you know. And then it's 100 to 7, you know. We're outplaying them, but the score is 100 to 7, right? And that's kind of where we are. The rate that this, um, I, I don't know what to call it, uh, this, um, I don't want to call it a movement, but... Uh, the, the rate at which humanity is coming together to address global warming is faster than the rate at which the problem is increasing. Now, the problem has so much momentum and inertia and money and power and the capacity to corrupt leaders around the world that it is daunting. And the odds are long, but we'll take them. Because uh, we have to. <laughs> There's no other way to do it. And so the way you solve it is the way you solve it here. You solve it in place. You solve it in neighborhood. You solve it in community. You solve it in city and town. You solve it where you are with what you have at hand, whether it's the mine tunnels underneath for storage or the sunshine above or whatever it is that you have. And that's what's happening around the world. And that is sort of blocked out by the headlines and by... Uh, the media. We don't see that. And what we tried to show with Project Drawdown is that humanity is on the case. They really are. We really are. And so it's a smaller we, Project Drawdown, 200 and some odd people, reflecting back to a larger we, includes you, what we are doing and what we know. That's what we're doing. The data, what you see in, in the book or the website, is what we are doing and what we know. 
it's not our plan. We're not telling you what to do. We don't, we're not even being an advocacy group in that sense. We're advocating that we should do it, address global warming for sure, but we're not saying you should do this or this, or this is better. No, we're holding a mirror, a beautiful mirror up to humanity. And when you look at the coming attractions, there's 20 of them. There's actually two or three hundred more we have in the database. And these are nascent, incipient technologies that are coming, that are just on the horizon or just below it, and so forth. And they really are emblematic of how extraordinary humanity is in terms of its creativity, its ingeniousness, its innovativeness. Um, we are extraordinary. We really are. Uh, and we're passionate, and we're generous, and we're kind, and, we're kind, and, and we care. And again, that is blotted out by, you know, our media and by our television and by the newspapers and, frankly, by the Internet as well. Um, and lastly, I just want to talk about language, and, and I think I may have gone too long already, but this is probably the most important thing that we can do besides action, and that is to change how we talk about it because the way we're talking about it is alienating. It's also scientifically incorrect. You can't fight climate change, and why would you want to? Climate changes every nanosecond. That's what it's supposed to do. So the idea that you can fight it or combat it, you know, you know is, is, is absurd. It's really absurd. And using war or sports metaphors to talk about this extraordinary, beautiful system interacting with the surface of the earth, that is to say, weather, climate, atmosphere, and to use war metaphors to talk about our relationship to it, is the disease. It's the thinking that caused the problem. Because that means we're saying, we're objectifying it, it's not us, it's other, we've got to fix it when we screwed it up in the first place, now we've got to fix it, we've got to fight it. This way of thinking is so odd. So odd. It's otherness. When the first ships came here from England, who were the people who lived here? They were other. It was otherness. Like, and so it justified in people's minds extraordinary acts of cruelty and harassment and atrocities and destruction. The Me Too movement is about objectifying women. This is about objectifying the earth, the climate, the atmosphere. It's the same mindset. And so anytime we think of a gender, a culture, a race, a person, a place, anything as other, then we are in the mindset that caused the problem, and we cannot do that. And we're, we basically, with that last number, 2C, we pretty much disengaged 99% of the people in the world. Australia is very different. It's not true here, but I urge you to go elsewhere in the world. I have. I talk to people. And they're like, forget about it. Why? 2C, 2050. What does that really mean? Well, it's the Paris Agreement. What does that mean? Well, 2C is when something bad happens. What happens? It's science-based target. It is not. It was pulled out of thin air in 1975 by Richard Nordhaus at Yale, an economist, and Joachim Schellenhuber in 1994, a great climate scientist in Germany. And both will tell you they pulled it out of thin air. But let's say it is true that it is science agreed, that is the target. Targets 32 years from now mean nothing to people, nothing at all. The human brain is wired to deal with current existential threat, not future existential threat. The human beings that are very concerned about future existential threat are not in the gene pool anymore. Your ancestors did a really good job about current existential threat. That's why you're here tonight. Thank them. So again, when we talk about reversing, addressing climate change, we talk about a movement, what we have to do is think about addressing current human needs. And we're the only species without full employment. Think about that. Every other species is busy all day long, goes to sleep. And we actually create a society, an economic system that marginalizes people, say you have no value at all, right? How do we do that? And never has there been so much beautiful, 
extraordinary, restorative, regenerative, kind work needed to be done then, right now. Never. So our path to reversing global warming is actually to address human needs with the solutions you see in Dwarada and many others as well, by the way. I'm not limiting it to that whatsoever, which are regenerative development, which is healing the future and designing, building, engineering, administering, farming, foresting, you know, everything we do now, moving, trans uh, mobility in such a way that when we do that, the world becomes a better place. Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.